So thank you all for coming. My name is Gabe Hollenby. I'm a technical evangelist with Amazon Web Services. And today, it's not a typo, today's talk is a rapid, rapid mobile API development with GraphQL and AWS AppSync talk. And I say rapid, rapid because I've only got 15 minutes. So the point of this talk is not to teach you all there is to know about GraphQL or AWS AppSync, but rather to expose you to something you might not have followed or known about before and give you something exciting to go learn about more after today. Uh, one of those ways you can uh, learn more is to keep in touch with me on Twitter. My handle is in the footer of all of the subsequent slides, uh, so that's a great way to stay in touch, and I'm happy to follow up with any of you individually after this talk, too. So before we get started, hands up if you've used GraphQL before. Cool, a few. Uh, used or heard of AWS AppSync? Good, a few. Uh, and last one, um, how many of you are hoping to learn something about graph databases today? Okay. The first thing you're going to learn is that GraphQL has nothing to do with graph databases, at least not intrinsically. Uh, it's completely, despite the name, uh, it, 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 which I can understand why it might be confusing, has nothing to do with graph databases. Although you can use graph databases with GraphQL, it's, it's not for querying graph databases explicitly. Let's get into the themes. So here's a typical mobile uh, app screen. Uh, this is a master detail view. And what you've got here is you know, a list of, let's say, email inbox items on the left and a detailed view of one of your particular messages on the right. And if we were to build an API for showing this inbox, what kind of questions do we need to answer? Right? Well, we need to know, well, how are you going to get a list of what you should show in the sidebar? Uh, and do we just want to use one endpoint for everything? If I just said, like, get me all my messages, uh, well, that's going to be huge, and there's more, that's way too much data to fetch. Uh, so you might say, well, I'm going to have one that's going to get me the data for just the sidebar, one that's going to get me the data for just an individual message by a particular ID, for example. But then you've got things like handling threading and how am I going to support that. And so what often happens is, in a, in a traditional RESTful uh, API development style, you're, you're forced to make a lot of these decisions about how you're going to fulfill the data requirements of your front end, of your client. GraphQL takes a different approach and says, let's let the client tell the back end what it needs for any given section of the UI that it wants to render. And the back end will fulfill only those pieces of data that it needs, as long as it conforms to a particular schema that was uh, agreed upon beforehand. So what do we want uh, to make our app development lives easier is we want a flexible client schema. So again, this is where I'm saying, You've got an ability to say, these are my data types in my system. These are the types of queries and mutations uh, I want to be able to affect uh, as side effects or as, as queries in my system. And uh, these are the, uh, the pieces of data I want back for a given query. Uh, a query in GraphQL tells you not what you're going to get back, but the full list of data you could ask for back. So you could ask for any subset of the data that a particular query fulfills back. You don't have to get it all. Uh, obviously, you want this to work with minimal data transfer over the network, uh, both from a subscription point of view, so you don't have to do a lot of polling. You want something that's battery and network efficient. Uh, it should work offline, uh, and you should have instant access to your data when you're offline, uh, or even if you're online, but before you've made a fetch to the server to get maybe updated data, right? So you want some sort of caching and offline capabilities for your app. And of course, you want scalability and security uh, built into whatever you're going to use for your backend, because those are important for your super successful app that you're building. So how can we get these things? Well, for the first two, we can use a UI-driven protocol like GraphQL. And I'll tell you more about the specifics of that in a minute. For the next two, for network connectivity and instant access, you're going to want a mobile client SDK with some sort of offline caching capabilities. And finally, when it comes to scalability and security, I recommend hosting your back end for your API somewhere in the cloud, because it's one less thing for you to have to manage. Right? You don't have to want to maintain uh, your, your server for your API uh, that's fulfilling data if you can help it. That's something that could be a solved problem for you. Let's talk about GraphQL. It's a query language for your API. And it's fulfilled by a compatible, uh, uh, compatible service on the back end that knows how to take the queries that the client is asking for and respond to the appropriate data. There's no specific language or technology needed for GraphQL. GraphQL is just a spec. It says, here's how you should define your schemas, and this is how the client should ask for data from the back end, and your back end should respond to data requests in, or mutations in this fashion. So it's just a spec that you can implement in any language with the technologies of your choice. 
Here's an example query and response. So everything in GraphQL, the queries, they all start with the word query, as you can see. And here, uh, the client gets to choose an operation name. And this is because you can actually submit more than one operation over the wire at a time. And GraphQL wants to know at the server side, how am I going to tell you for each of the things you asked for uh, what that piece of response should be? So in this case, I'll say git post is my, uh, my operation name for this query. Uh, your queries can have variables parameterized into them, which will get used uh, in the actual uh, GraphQL uh, query below. So in a minute, you'll see we have a schema that says one of the queries I can do is called post. And if I use the post query, I have to pass an ID. And then I can get a whole bunch of different data back. In this case, this is like a typical blog example, as I'm sure you can tell. Uh, I'm going to ask for the ID of the post, the title, and then you can have nested data too. That's completely allowed. And so we can say we want comments for each post, but I only want the content for, for that maybe, you know, because comments might have a, a content, an author, a date stamp, et cetera. For this particular example, we just want to pull the content from the related comments for a post. And this is the data you get back if you, if you issue this request uh, or what you might get back for a given schema and some example data. So it's pretty easy to understand. You can see all the data comes back in a keyword called data, uh, or a key called data, rather, in the JSON response. And it's JSON, so it's familiar. You've worked with this before, probably. And of course, we get our operation name echoed back to us as a sub uh, attribute of the data object. And then everything else we ask for is in there. Well, what do schemas look like? This might be a little hard to see. I'm sorry, uh, in the back, uh, I should maybe make this a little bit more high resolution for the future. But your schema is defining the security perimeter of your app. It says, here are all of the types of data in my system that I want to allow uh, data coming in and out about. Uh, and, uh, and it's strongly typed because of that. So all the requests and responses can only involve the data I describe in my schema. Now, it, because we have this, this schema definition language for GraphQL, it's self-documenting, right? Your APIs become easy to explore uh, because uh, tools can introspect the schema definition and give you, uh, you know, IntelliSense, navigatable uh, auto-completion, and uh, uh, you, know, you can put comments in here too, so you can describe things if it's not obvious enough. You can also uh, generate code from this pretty easily. So if you want to make an SDK for a particular language, for example, uh, you can take a GraphQL schema and there are tools that will generate out, you know, source code files in the language of your choice that, that have all the methods to, to implement these schemas, for example. And then you can do advanced typing too. Go to graphql.org slash learn to learn more about that. So on the back end, uh, you know, I recommend you should use serverless. Serverless doesn't mean no servers, right? It's just servers you don't have to manage. It's kind of a buzzword in the industry, but I use it here in the context of it's a service that somebody else is going to manage so you don't have to worry about scalability and, and, and security typically, right? No servers to manage, as I said. Uh, the idea, the key component of serverless in general is that it'll scale as your usage needs. Uh, you don't have to think about that or it should be very easy to scale. Um, you're only going to pay for what you use typically. Uh, and of course, all of this lets you focus more on your application and less on the devops -y side of you know, building a backend uh, API for your data and maintaining it and making sure that it's going to scale and stay secure. You have a few options when it comes to building your data services. A popular one might be, okay, I'm going to make a GraphQL service myself in the language of my choice, and I'm going to wrap that up in a Docker container and, and ship that up to the cloud provider of my choice and run it there. That's fine. Uh, containers are standard, and they can run anywhere. Uh, but then now you have to manage your container as well as your code for your app uh, that you had to write for the back end. Uh, and you're going to have to deal with the scaling and the security stuff. Uh, GraphQL as a service, there are a couple options out there already uh, in the market. The nice thing about this is you generally don't have to write a lot of code to get started with this, uh, and the scaling is somebody else's problem, right? Uh, and you'll only pay for maybe the queries that you're using uh, or the, the operations that you're uh, emitting. So AWS AppSync is such a service uh, provided by Amazon Web Services. Uh, it's a managed service that we make that uh, lets you expose your application data to your clients using GraphQL. It's got real-time capabilities built in. Uh, a nice offline programming model. Uh, so uh, with synchronization, there's server-side conflict resolution supported. Uh, there's a lot of different database sources that we can plug into AppSync out of the box. Uh, and you can even implement pretty fine-grained access control. When it comes to the data sources, uh, a few are built in right now. I should also mention this is available in the Singapore region uh, today. It wasn't at launch, but it, it is now. So uh, for all of you here who are interested in using AWS in Singapore, you can use AppSync in Singapore. 
And uh, DynamoDB is a NoSQL database option uh, that we have on AWS. Uh, we have uh, AppSync can connect natively to that and also to Elasticsearch uh, for more complicated uh, you know, queries, uh, fuzzy matching, geospatial queries, that type of stuff. And of course, the, the ultimate, I think, is that you can also use a Lambda function. So an AWS Lambda function is just a piece of code that runs uh, and can do anything you want, right? Uh, you can write your, your Lambda functions in a number of different languages. And uh, they'll, you can do anything in a Lambda function. You could talk to DynamoDB in your Lambda. You could talk to an RDBMS like Postgres or MySQL uh, or Aurora. Um, but a nice thing about Lambda also is you can combine different data sources directly into to resolving uh, one particular uh, field uh, for your queries, et cetera. And you can support relationships between your data sources that way. So I have a demo prepared, uh, and it's a video because I didn't want to depend on the Wi-Fi uh, in the conference. So let me get to that, and uh, we'll see what this looks like. So this is a, a two-minute demo of uh, AppSync with uh, the, the web console that we have in AWS. So before I play it, let me just show you, I'll walk you through the sample schema. So when you go to AppSync on AWS and you say, make me a new API, you have a choice. You can write your own schema from scratch, which you should do if you know what you're doing, but if you just want to get started and, and, and dip your toes in the water, there's an option for bootstrap me an example schema uh, with some uh, field resol resolvers already in place so I can have a fully functioning example API out of the box with just a click. And this is the example schema. So it's for uh, an event system. So we could say, for example, there's an event, Vox Days, uh, you know, at the Marina Bay Sands Convention Center on June 1st, some description. Uh, events can have comments, et cetera. And uh, there's not really much more to it than that. Uh, there are entry points for all schemas in GraphQL are this thing in the bottom right where it says schema. So uh, schema say we, we support queries, mutations, and subscriptions. Those are the three key types uh, of uh, data, in, or I should say operations in GraphQL. And you can see here that each of those references another part in the schema. So the two queries are get event with an ID, or I can ask for a list of events, and I can do pagination built in, et cetera. Uh, and the same thing for mutations. I can create an event, delete an event, or comment on an event. So that's just a walkthrough of the schema. Let me show you what this looks like in practice if you're using the web console. OK, here we go. So. I'm just going to go and click Create API. Oh, yeah, the resolution isn't really good on this projector. I'm just giving it a name. I'll just walk you through it because you can't see this very much. Uh, the, I guess they're not HD uh, projectors. Uh, anyway, it's just creating the API right now. It takes a second while it builds a DynamoDB database for you, et cetera. Now, our, our console here for AppSync gives you a schema explorer on the left where you can edit your schema. And it also has a uh, interactive query uh, tool where you can type queries here. In this case, I'm typing Give me the uh, all events, uh, list events query. And I'm exploring the, the relations between these on the right. Again, I'm sorry you can't see it because the, uh, the resolution isn't so great. Uh, but the video of this will also be online, so you can watch it there. Or you can just go into AWS AppSync yourself and play around. Uh, but what you can see here is I, I can go ahead and I can make a mutation. In this case, I'm creating a new event. It says breakfast at Tiffany's, but you can't read that. Uh, and it, uh, it'll say where it is, and, and it'll, it'll type some things out according to that. I'm probably going to cut this demo short because it's not super useful because you can't read what's actually happening. But safe to say, uh, you can see what's happening here a little bit as I'm getting IntelliSense automatically auto-completion and stuff. If, you use, if you've used other GraphQL uh, editors before, like Graphical, it's a very similar experience. Uh, you can also get logs streamed directly into this interactively from your resolvers that, as they're happening as they're fulfilling the data requests. Uh, so that it makes it sort of a nice one-stop shop for exploring your current schema and making it work. Now, what you don't see here, uh, and I'll just tell you, is it also spins up uh, not just the data source, in this case a DynamoDB uh, table or tables to support these queries for creating events and comments, but also the resolvers. So uh, out of the box, it makes it all those operations you saw in the schema, which I'll just go back to because that's probably easier than watching uh, the video that you can't read. All these operations are already implemented for you, and it makes it a great way for you to go say, OK, how do I do this for my own APIs that I want to build? What's the right way for me to look up items from DynamoDB, for example, or to uh, get, a, uh, get a list of items or do pagination? So there's some great examples already there for you. And there's even more. If you go into the editors for editing your resolvers for these different fields, uh, it can explain. Uh, you'll see a lot of different uh, example code to use. Wow. I'm at 14 minutes and 55 seconds, so 
let me wrap up by just saying thank you very much. Uh, I think GraphQL is really cool. Uh, I really like AWS AppSync. I've used it a lot of my own projects already. And, uh, it's definitely something you should check out if GraphQL interests you when you want to run it in the cloud. Learn more. GraphQL.org slash learn is a great resource. Uh, everything you want to know about AppSync is at aws.amazon.com slash AppSync. You can follow AWS for mobile on Twitter. That's a really great account to keep track of, uh, as well as uh, following me on Twitter. I'm just at Gabe Hollenby. Uh, thank you so much for coming and spending some time at your lunch to hear me uh, share this. <laughs> <laughs>